Warning. Between 1907 and 1983, the U.S. sterilized over 60,000 people, particularly young, poor women, based on unscientific IQ tests. The United States successfully argued for the first ever immigration quotas in the 1920s based on unscientific IQ tests, and in 1924 won the pro-eugenic U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Buck v. Bell based on an unscientific IQ test. Eugenics was taught in the most prestigious American universities, and Nazis cited dozens of American influences in their genocidal campaigns for what they called racial hygiene. And the United States continued eugenic sterilizations decades after the Nuremberg trials. General intelligence cannot be transformed into a meaningful single number, and attempts to do so have been a moral disaster for humankind. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Seriously Wrong Podcast. My name is Aaron. And my name is Sean. And uh, doing an episode today talking about a little old thing, a little old something that goes up in your noggin, but also fits on a calculator. <laughs> that's right. That's right. IQ, intelligence quotient. It's a number that represents general intelligence, just a single number. Just like you can measure how tall someone is with a measuring tape, they stand against the wall and you measure, get a specific number of exactly how tall they are. Yeah, you step on a scale, you weigh this many pounds or whatever. Yeah, exactly. That's one measurement. That's another. Then another dimension that one can measure objectively, stepping back, is how many brain numbers do you have? Yeah, brain points. Not the size of your brain, not the weight of your brain, nothing like that. It's kind of just how good the brain is, how powerful, how useful. Yeah, I think I probably first encountered the idea of IQ like on The Simpsons or something as a kid. I remember just thinking it was a real thing that measured something and having more than 100 IQ was good and having a really high number in IQ was really good. I remember thinking that as a child and believing that to be true. Yeah, I don't even remember where I first heard it. Like, it was just part of the fabric of reality in my mind as a child. The extent to which it was taken as a given in the media and the world that I was in was very, very high. It's kind of commonsensical in a way, be just measuring people's brain ability or something like that. But when you think about it a little bit, there's a lot of weird assumptions that go into the idea of an IQ score in the first place, how it's tested all that sort of stuff that it's hard to look at it in that same light as just measuring something that's there. I feel like the more you think about it, the more the basic logic of it starts to fall apart. Definitely. So yeah, this week on the show, we're going to sit and watch as the logic of IQ falls apart before our very eyes. And to kick it off, we're going to play a little bit of audio from Stephen Jay Gould talking about his book, The Mismeasure of Man, and laying out four key objections to the idea of IQ. Now, he's doing it here in the context of responding to Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein's The Bell Curve, well known for being a racist, pseudoscientific screed about IQ, but important to note, too, that The Bell Curve wasn't just using IQ to be racist, it was using IQ to justify almost every hierarchy in current society. Those four assumptions that underline the sort of ideology of IQ, number one, a meaningful single number to intelligence, number two, that you're able to rank people on it, number three, it's highly heritable, and number four, it's effectively unchangeable. Unless all four of those things are true, the common sense way that people talk and think about IQ can't be true. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Stephen J. Gould. Why do you think uh, American society is so obsessed with IQ? I don't know that we're obsessed by it. 
In fact, I'm not sure that IQ in the old-fashioned sense is much measured by mental testers at all today, except if you read Ernstein and Murray's bell curve, clearly these data still exist. I just didn't think that many people granted that number much meaning anymore. But in a basically racist climate in a country with a strong racist history, I suppose it's not surprising that particularly conservative social thinkers would try to relate poor performance of blacks to intrinsic biological limits. As I like to put it, the quick critique of the bell curve is that it's based upon four assumptions, all of which have to be true. If any one of them is false, the whole argument collapses. First, there has to be a meaningful single number that can be given to intelligence. I think that's false. Secondly, you have to be able to rank people in a single linear order upon it. And that order has to then correlate with social attributes, whether you go to prison or not, whether you have children out of wedlock, etc., your income. Thirdly, that number has to be highly heritable. And fourthly, it has to be unchangeable or effectively unchangeable. A lot of people confuse the third and fourth. They assume that if something's heritable, it means it's unchangeable, but that's false. Suppose the first three were true and they're not. I mean, suppose there was a legitimate number and you could rank people and it was highly hereditary. It still could be very mutable. For example, the obvious example is I may have an inherited defect of vision, which is 100% inherited, and I go to the drugstore and I buy a pair of eyeglasses and my vision is fine. I mean, it could be the equivalent of buying the pair of eyeglasses, namely programs of remedial education might boost IQ and then the whole argument would collapse. We have this terrible tendency to try and make things simple, try and get a single number. There's a whole history and subject after subject of trying to encompass complex and independent attributes with a single number. My colleague, Medawar, for example, once wrote a very interesting article showing how in soil science, it's a totally different field, people for decades got hung up on trying to get a single number to measure the quality of soil. And how can you do that? There's no such thing as the quality of soil. This one is 51. This one is 76.2. There, there isn't. There are just different things that soils can do. Now, the human mind is even more complex. There is no number that can capture the quality of mind. And it's almost humorous to think that there is. But unfortunately, the assumption that we can do such a thing tied to the use of such theories by conservative social ideologies has had profoundly negative consequences for the lives of millions of people. There are millions of people, particularly in this country, who've been told they can't do this, who've been denied admission to this or that program on the basis of a number, which was falsely interpreted as representing an intrinsic limit upon them based on their biology, but was in fact only a measure of social influences upon their lives. If you look at Binet's original intentions in setting up the IQ test, and you see Binet was a French psychologist, and he was commissioned by the Commissioner of Education in France to devise a test to find students who needed help. In fact, he specifically argued against giving a hereditary interpretation because he understood that if you did that, you would misinterpret the number as a limit rather than an aid. He wanted to use the number as an aid to identify children who needed help so that they could be given help and uh, everything could be done for them. Whereas if you give a hereditary interpretation, then you identify a low score with people who can't be helped. The exact opposite occurs. You invert the original purpose. We now go back to the very beginning, the invention of IQ and its founder's beautiful vision. Eureka, I've done it. Everyone, come here, come here. Oh, what is it? What is it? I've invented a test that we can deliver to children which will help us understand their educational needs and accomplishment so we can give more attention to the people who need more help so they can catch up with their peers. We can use it to tell their mental age, and then if their mental age is too low, we can help build them up and have them catch up with everyone. Oh, right. If it's lower than the other kids, we can call them stupid and say that they're just like that, and if they don't get better, that they're going to be worthless forever. That's a great idea. Wow, th well, you've it, done it. not exactly my idea. Isn't that what you were saying? No, it's the, that we could use this to rank kids' mental ages and then say some are worse than others. And, you know, maybe it has something to do with their parents. Maybe if we find the kids who are behind and they don't get better right away, we could sterilize their parents. 
No, it's not about ranking the children against each other. It's about each individual child to determine their level and then give them more attention and more help. You can't put the kids next to each other and say one's better than the other, you know. It's not that the intelligence is something that's there that can be measured. It's not like measuring a plank of wood. It's just a way of helping to interpret and find those kids so you can give them the help. It's not exactly what you're talking about. Right, of course. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, so we'll find the lowest performing children and help them onto a isolated colony along with all of the people who are like them and we sterilize them all. Is that what you're saying? No, what is this? You keep on, what's this sterilized thing? You keep on saying this sterilized thing. That has nothing to do with my you idea. You know, you can give some kids attention and caring or whatever, but, no, but it's just a test. I don't know if you've ever tried that. It doesn't work. Maybe I'm making a mistake on the explaining, but. You said mental age of the children, and I heard, oh, yeah, some people are baby brains, and this test helps us find the baby brains. Let me just. So you don't want to sterilize people? I'm getting confused again. No, geez. Geez, no. What you do is you tell whether children need more help if you know you find for example they're a year behind now it's just a metaphor it's not literal years if it shows that they're behind on reading for example then you would give them more attention and helping them to develop their reading skills so they're caught up with the average i don't know where this idea you have about sterilization is coming from if that's where this is going then i have to throw out the whole idea but like i don't think it would go there it doesn't follow directly it's going to be a huge boon for white supremacy maybe out of left field i'm just throwing that one out there i'm getting white supremacy vibes from this what i I didn't think of that at all, but if that... No, I think we're good. Don't have to worry about that. Maybe we'll just release this idea to the public and see what happens, see which way people go with it. I think it's a great idea. People are generally reasonable, and my suspicion is that this won't be used to argue for sterilization or racial hierarchies or immigration restrictions. It's just, in my original intention, and as it currently stands, I believe we're just going to give kids a little extra help when they need it. That's my bet. That's what I'm thinking. My bet is that it will be used to do all of those things. It's just a simple test for the helping of children. It should stand on its own two feet. And that was the origin of IQ and its founder's beautiful vision. I've taken a lot of IQ tests before, like online IQ tests before. I've never taken a real from an institution or whatever. But basically every IQ test I've ever taken has required skills and not just some raw measure of brain. You would assume if you could raw measure brain power, you could just, I don't know, hook up an electrode or something, see how much electricity is going through there, see how powerful the thoughts are. Something that's more objective than how willing you are and how well you're able to do this particular little dance for us. As in like, Taking an IQ test is playing a game of responding to these questions that they're putting in front of you. Usually it's on a timer, you're doing it as quickly as possible and whatnot. And the idea that there's no other factors at play with how well someone is going to do playing that game other than just their intelligence is really strange especially when a lot of them have questions that require specific knowledge. Yeah, some of the historic IQ tests you see, they gave one to all of the U.S. Army recruits in 1918 that included questions like, what is the mascot of this cigarette brand? The IQ test that I took when I was younger on the internet and stuff like that didn't usually go as far in that direction in terms of being, is Aunt Jemima on a syrup bottle or is she on a <laughs> type of gum? <laughs> it's so absurd. Just the idea that people's familiarity with advertising brands was one of the things that was included in some historic IQ tests. But the ones that I've taken more recently, uh, like in my lifetime, it's more stuff like if there's two walls that are this big and you need to cover them with panels that are this big, how many panels do you need? math or logic problems and stuff like that, which on one hand, it does measure whether or not you have the tools and knowledge to conceive mathematically of an area. 
you know, with times lengths and stuff like that and do math like that. That's on one level is being test. But a big thing that you're being tested on, which shows if you do test more than once, is you're being tested on familiarity with these certain types of questions and scenarios. Familiarity with that type of math or logic problem could be the difference between scoring a average or below average IQ and scoring an exceptional IQ, how familiar you are with logic puzzles that are shaped in the ways that whatever IQ test you happen to be taking is using. It's fluency in this meta subject that's being tested, among other things. That's what I was getting at with familiarity with the game that's being played, just kind of knowing what they're getting at and what they want you to do, that kind of thing. I've never taken an IQ test that asked me about specific brands of anything or extremely culturally dependent things like that have generally been scrubbed. But even various logic puzzles and things assume not just fluency with basic English, but sometimes with idiosyncratic words or following a very specific intended to be kind of tricky grammar where they're implying something without saying it. The fact that I've taken enough tests like this to know to be on the lookout for that kind of thing and that it's quick for me because I know this game isn't the same thing as having a better brain or whatever. One of the ones that I ran into while prepping for this episode was on online Stanford Binet. They asked, which is the proper word to use? Sang, sang, sung. And I was like, oh man, fuck this. That has nothing to do with IQ, grammatic convention. I don't even know what is technically correct when you're talking about having sung in the past, sang in the past. I don't know. Or one of those really that bad? I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> I would have probably got that one wrong or only right by a guess. Is the difference between the past tense and the past participle of sing? Like she sang versus she has sung. I just learned that by looking it up. When I took the test, I wasn't losing sleep over it, but I was just like, I don't really know, actually. And if I had known how to prepare for that, I could have made the test think I was a genius. But it doesn't come up in regular life. It's like, if someone corrects you on that, they're like being a dick. It's definitely nothing to do with raw intelligence. One of the issues around here is almost like a failure to acknowledge that being is becoming in thinking that you can have like a snapshot that is reflective of someone's essence. There's examples of advocates of IQ tests who basically believe this, that the snapshot will tell you everything that you need to know about someone, that they've been measured objectively. I think a prominent example of this is if you want to join Mensa, you get one shot to test. I think you get two shots, technically, two different tests in case there's one that's more linguistic and one that's more symbol-based or something like that. Right. But it's like if you try to get into Mensa, which is this high IQ society, and you fail, then you failed their test, and it's proof that you, <laughs> it's pr it's proof that you're not smart enough that you didn't measure up. Right. Whether or not you join the society is based on how you do on a test one time. Yeah, and I think part of the rationale for that is because of this. Oh, once you've taken the test once, you know what's coming, and you can be able to game it better and whatnot. So we have to just one time and that's it, because otherwise it's contaminated. But it just creates all this pre-pressure to like, okay, like if I cared about getting into Mensa and I wanted to test in, I'd be doing all this prep. I'd be doing all this reading. I'd be taking as many different kinds of IQ tests as I could. This is your one shot, right? So, and then like, how much time do you have to do that study? How much motivation and dedication, how much does your life support your ability to ramp up to this one time and take the test and do really well? And hopefully everything goes well on the day. So it's not that you got bad news or whatever, and you pull it all off. I can understand the rationale for wanting to control for the idea that taking it more than once gives you an advantage, but then they're just ignoring all this other stuff that implementing that control presents, which is just that there's a way to game that system too, by doing all this prep and whatnot. Another thing, I feel like I kind of have an advantage on this from the type of student I was, but a lot of these tests, they're multiple choice tests. And if you had the same relationship towards school that I did, which was not very into studying and like trying to just get by, 
something I figured out is that if you just genuinely don't know the answer to a question, you can look at the multiple choices being offered. And as a result of those multiple choices, make an educated guess that has a better than half chance of being correct. There's Raven's progressive matrices, which is like series of patterns and you guess what comes next based on the patterns. And Stanford Binet was a lot of it is multiple choice with math and stuff like that. In times where I couldn't figure out the Raven's progressive thing, or I wasn't certain, I could discern between the options what was more or less likely. And similarly with the Stanford Binet one, the first time I tried to do it, I just really took my time, tried to figure stuff out. And the first time I did it where I didn't game the system, where I didn't think about these sort of things, I performed much worse, just trying to answer sincerely and figure everything out. The second time, after I knew the types of questions that they did and what to expect, I started doing things like looking at the answers they gave first before even trying any math and then figuring out which one seemed closest and then just locking it and moving it on because it was a time-tested thing. And a question that I didn't get to was worth the same as a question that I quickly answered wrong. There was an advantage. It showed in my results. There was an advantage to just slamming through and making educated guesses on each one if I didn't have the context or mental power to actually go through all the mathematical steps. And on that second testing, I did very well. The first testing, I did all right. Retesting, I feel like the big advantage isn't even necessarily knowing the specific answers. Like, oh, I remember this question and I know that I already did the math and it came to this and I came up with this answer, which would happen if you do the exact same tests over and over again. But there's also another more subtle kind of thing, which is the broader metagame we're talking about, where it's like, I recognize that it's this type of question and therefore I know what the types of questions are and therefore I can strategize on the meta going in and as a result test to appear quote unquote genius. Whereas (laughs) without that preparation, all that meta thought may not have occurred to someone going in the first time. So yeah, like even if you don't have access to the exact test results, there's a huge advantage that comes from having access to the shape of what testing is like in general. This sort of thing plays out on a systemic scale. When you're actually trying to use this as a way of evaluating and measuring a population or a group of people, people who are familiar with the type of test that they're in for and have an interest in performing well and know the metagame enough of when to make educated guesses and when to actually do the dedicated legwork. All these things can make a massive difference on how someone tests. We now go to Brainsley and Geniusman, two genius, smart, big brain rivals who've been fighting for a very long time. Oh, Brainsley, Brainsley, have you figured out the answer to my riddle yet? (laughs) Genius, man, those pitiful, unchallenging little riddles. I can't figure it out, can you? Uh, It's okay, neither can 90% of the population. (laughs) That is what someone with a brain score of 136 would say. (laughs) You're just jealous of my 137.5 big brain score. (laughs) Oh, that's rich. Coming from the guy who stopped playing chess with me when my winning streak became too much for their fragile little ego to handle. You know, they say chess is the game of intellectual champions, Brainsley. Mm, Genius, man. I think we both know that you were using the strategies and tactics of grandmasters who came before you. Now, I'm the type of person who would invent his own strategies, and I'm a little bit beyond these little childish games. True intellectuals want to abolish all monarchies. So playing kings and queens is most certainly a small-brained pursuit. It's so cute that you don't understand the intellectual depth of chess and riddles and tongue twisters. I think if I had a test score as low as yours, I would be seeking all sorts of sophist, pseudo-intellectual justifications for it as well. So I don't blame you at all. Look, if it was someone with a very low score, but 136, 130, it's within the margin of error. Well, it's not measuring nothing. Oh, well, we'll see what it's measuring and what it's not measuring, but... It's times like this where I have to say that despite our differences and despite your clear lack of sophistication on so many of these topics, I enjoy verbally sparring with you on the important topics of the day such as these far more than I would with any peasant outside of the walls of these big brain institutions. 
you know, we like to bicker about 136, 137, who beat who at chess, the greatest intellectual game in history. But really, if I'm going to be honest, we're both in the upper crust. Yeah, just think of the enormous intellectual capacity difference from the 137 group to the 136 group, which is obviously substantial, very large, and I think meaningful. It may have something to do with inborn potential. And think that there's far, far more on the outsides of our walled kingdom of genius who are worth even more contempt. I agree with you entirely. Right. And even if we recognize that fine distinctions like 136 and 137 can't make that big of a difference, we do know that overall the tests do work. And that while neither of us should be sterilized, people below a certain number should... I don't know what the number is. Maybe 120? 118? I don't know. But I would say we're both safely above it. A lot of people are saying, and with no joy, that we face an overpopulation crisis and the line might have to be drawn at 137 because there's so few resources. And that's just what I'm hearing. But in all likelihood, we won't have to go that far. But if it does come to that, well... It must be some of the low brain point people saying that because it's such a bad idea. It's probably coming from someone low, low down. Oh, no, it's the highest. That's not what I've heard from the higher ups. It's actually staggering how many fewer 136ers support that compared to the 137s, which tend to support it. If you look at the data, it's staggering. So it might show the inborn failure of the 136s, that inherent difference. You know, I'm still petitioning the big brain society to have you retest it. I'm starting to think that you just closed your eyes and picked answers randomly on the test and just lucked into being here. You and I both know that wouldn't work. (laughs) Wow. That is hilariously low brain point thing that you just said. No, it's high brain point. It was a high brain point. Low thing. brain point. Low brain mm. point point. Your point there was low brain point point. If I had brain points like yours, I wouldn't be throwing those words around. If I had brain points like yours, I'd be embarrassed to be saying the things that you're saying. Genius men. Oh, brainsly. Ugh. I feel like another thing with test taking that I just noticed a lot in school when I was in high school and junior high school and stuff, I was always a pretty good test taker, but people I knew who weren't good test takers, they had a very different relationship to tests than I did. Whereas I was like, oh, this is kind of a game. I fill in as many right answers as I can. And you know, usually it gets pretty good. There's people whose relationship to tests were more defined by I'm bad at school and I'm bad at tests, just feeling like they couldn't do it. Yeah. And these aren't people who in day-to-day life, I was like, oh, wow, they routinely confuse basic logic things or can't do a little bit of math here. And these are not stupid people, right? Just people I know who can be brilliant at things, but not good at tests. I feel like not taking into account how much someone cares about taking tests or whether they think this whole thing is stupid and why do I have to do this? Or they're like, oh, let's see how good of a score I can get. I've seen research that in places where it's very warm, having air conditioning has measurable effects on how good kids do on IQ tests. I've seen tons of things like that, but that one's always just stuck in my mind as you wouldn't think of that necessarily. Even if you're doing broad IQ studies, and what do we control for? Okay, socioeconomic status, and we'll try and hit the big ones, right? But there's just so much variation between individuals that so many things can compound on one another to just really affect how much that individual person who's sitting there taking the test is willing and able to play that game. It's a kind of myopia to think that we can just ignore all that stuff and grade the test, put it through the grading machine and pop out a number and there you go. Just another broad metaphor. It's like if you give someone an IQ test in French, but they only speak German, then chances are that they're going to test very low. And you're going to come away with the conclusion that their intelligence is this measurement when they've actually got this limitation of not speaking the language, which doesn't at all speak to their capacity for intelligence. It speaks to their lack of fluency in the language that's being used. It's the same for subject matter and metagame like we've talked about. Actually understanding that people are moving through these steps needs to be baked into it. 
So the way IQ tests work, I don't think we've said this yet, is that IQ tests guesses your mental age, and then they divide your mental age by your age and then times by 100. And that's how they come up with the number in its relation to 100. So if you're exactly your quote unquote mental age, that's 100. Wait, so what do you mean they estimate your mental age, like based on the answers you get? Yeah, I don't know if they still conceptualize it this way in the back end, but when IQ tests were developed, they were developed in relation to children. Right. And there's a lot of difference between children at different developmental ages. Right. So from that, a five-year-old who acts like a five-year-old would have an IQ of 100. A five-year-old that was precocious and talked like a nine-year-old would be IQ of 180. So then I think in the adult space, some of those same assumptions still factor into the measurement of it, but I'm not sure to what degree, honestly. I think it's reasonable when talking about children's development to say that they've got an accelerated development for their age. But that whole process of creating a number in relation to 100 that goes above and below, I think is a part that we can just fully abolish. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could see how testing various things together at one time could be a useful bank shot for developmental stages that children go through. But the idea of mental age just seems very spooky, like that you can precisely define what age someone's at, even though they might be better at some things and worse at other. Like it's the same thing as the single number thing or like, G general intelligence. It's this is maybe a weird analogy, but uh, <laughs> we don't rank cars on a goodness scale. How good is this car out of 150 or whatever? The average car. Yeah, 100 is the average car yeah. and <laughs> just search in either direction will bring its CQ down. <laughs> yeah. From what I understand, cars have different stats, you know, like how much can it pull? How many horsepowers does it have? How fast is the acceleration? How long can it maintain top speed? What's the miles per gallon? There's so many different ways to measure what cars can do and rank them against one another. And I feel like in general, it's similar for brains and that brains or humans with our brains we can think through a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. And to imagine there's one general intelligence, a single number there, that it's not just that your brain car is good at acceleration, it's that it's good. <laughs> car number. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's a valid way to collapse it all down to one number. I think the car quotient example gives a really potent example of how useless this concept is how any part of our life that we take seriously, we wouldn't reduce down to a number like that. So why would we take matters of people's intelligence so unseriously that we group it up like that? But also how, even if we're just going to be measuring one specific subcapacity, like the miles per gallon type specificness of intelligence measuring, when we're talking about humans, we need to acknowledge that humans work differently than cars. And we carry not just capacity, but potentiality, including potentiality for increased capacity. People change over time in a way that's not just wear and tear or something like that, or needing to have the oil changed or gas tank refilled or whatever. Although there's sort of, I guess, metaphorical connections to the human brain on all of those things. Sleeping at night, puts neurochemical waste out of your brain. The brain functions off of caloric intake and salt and stuff like that. So where you're at on that spectrum while you're being tested is relevant. Yeah. I know even as a good tester in general, if I was at school on a day where I had a headache or I was more tired than normal or any number of things were going on that were distracting me, I wouldn't do as good on the tests those times. And there's just so much that is contingent on how good of a day are you having? What is your life like outside of this one hour in which you're sitting here taking the test or whatever, this half an hour? We now go to an alternate universe where Stephen Jay Gould was wrong, and it's possible to assign a meaningful single number to intelligence. Eureka! We've done it! We found it! 
the single number. Oh my God, it's a for intelligence. Meaningful single number. It encompasses everything, all the complexities there, and that's incredible. Look at it. It's just oh. it's perfect. It just predicts everything. Who's going to be better at learning how to cook? Who's going to be better at math? Who's going to be better at singing and writing creatively? It's all in there. You know, a lot of people are telling us these doubters, these haters. They're like, how are you going to summarize people's capacity to multitask, their capacity for music, their verbal proficiency? You know, how are you going to make sure that you're measuring something that stays consistent over time and really reflects like not just the capacity on any given moment or day, but inherent deep capacity and like all these haters asking us these silly losers. questions. We're like, yeah, just wait, we'll figure it out. Yeah, losers. And not frankly, low numbered losers, I call them. LNLs, low numbered losers. And we said, just watch us. Just watch us as we piece this together. You might not have the numbers for it, but we do. You might think these are all a bunch of scattered capacities, each of which can be trained in various ways and that people have different strengths and weaknesses, but that also so many other things play factors in how people perform in various situations. And it's not just about their one single number underneath it all. And uh, we just proved them all wrong. You know, I think the moment that we really cracked this was when we figured out how much misspelling a word can be equated to doing a mathematical problem incorrectly. When we figured out that ratio, that sort of exchange rate between these different types and context of intellectualism, when we cracked that code, that's when we were like, okay, now we've really figured it out. All those late nights with charts and graphs and data sets thinking, oh, it won't fit, it won't work. You can't connect those two things. You can't convert across them. But, you know, one by one, the pieces started to fit together. And when the puzzle was finished, what we saw was a single number that we can just assign people and know exactly, precisely how intelligent they are. What do you think? We, what we should call this number? BP for brain points? I like that. It's clean. It's simple. It's what we're measuring. Brains. We're assigning points to it. Perfect. <laughs> this is an incredible day for science. I think we deserve a party, you and I. We'll take the night off dance, drink, talk. Yeah, you know, we've been working on this for a really long time and it's time to make our numbers go down a little bit just for one wonderful night. After we kick back, we relax a bit, then we can start talking about mass sterilization. Oh yeah, it was always on the chalkboard. One, find the number. Two, figure out the sterilization situation. Cognac? Here, I'm just gonna label this bottle haters and doubters tears because they will be crying at how successful we were. Oh, now that is clever. That is, uh, takes a lot of brain points to think up that one. Well, thank you very much. It's just a little humorous riff that I um, invented. Drinking tears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're good guys. What can I say? We're, we're like really good guys. And now back to our show. This is sort of the parable of Ellis Island. It's one of the most disturbing things that I've found in my research for this episode, and that's in a field of a lot of disturbing things. And I think that's disturbing about this to me is one of the really subtle implications of this story. So in the early 20th century in the United States, immigrants were coming into the United States through Ellis Island. And one of the jobs that was asked of the people who worked there was to turn away the feeble-minded to make sure that only the good stock were coming into America. So they had mechanisms to try to figure out who was feeble or fit to immigrate. But originally it was kind of an informal system. They'd ask them things like, you know, what date it is, ask them some knowledge questions. But generally, you know, they viewed these interactions as a human interaction where they would try to understand where the other person was at and also had an understanding that they'd just come on a long voyage, that they'd been through a lot basically. So it was an informal social process where they gave people the benefit of the doubt. And in 1908, out of 600,000 migrants, 186 were turned away to go back on the boat and to return because they were feeble-minded or epileptic or whatever of these things that they were turning people away for. And it's horrible to think, I mean, imagine traveling that far for weeks, bad conditions to try to escape some sort of situation and then to be turned away based on that sort of judgment. So it's 186 out of 600,000 in 1908. Following that, they started introducing more IQ test-like elements to the process, and they created more formal mechanisms, less interpersonal mechanisms and more formal mechanisms for determining who would be turned away or let in. The result of those changes towards testing was that in 1914, after they adopted these new tests, immigration officials excluded 1,077 people out of about 800,000. So proportionally, as a percentage of the whole, they were turning away four times as many people. This 
false sense of scientific reliability allowed people to do something inhumane and horrible to more people because they felt like they were being objective. My source on that is chapter five of IQ, A Smart History of a Failed Idea by Stephen Murdoch. And now back to our show. I'm kind of imagining defenders of IQ listening to this and being like, they're totally ignoring that IQ correlates somewhat to something sometimes. To some degree, IQ does measure something. I feel like I see this acknowledged a lot by even critics of IQ. One of the things I read in the last couple of days said that IQ tests in general, they're okay at telling when people have learning disabilities or who require extra help, but they're really bad at telling the difference between 120 and 130 on the average IQ scale. It's like kind of a crapshoot guess. Whereas if someone's reliably getting significantly under 100 IQ scores, then it's a sign that they have some sort of learning difficulty. Well, the thing is, too, if something shows that someone's partially illiterate, it speaks so little to their overall capacity and potential. And it really bothers me to conflate that. But I think you can tell when people are partially illiterate. And maybe there's some usefulness to that in being able to target with more help. I think that at a basic level can come from a good place. But I think in the current environment, it's hard to say in good faith that there's something there in general when it comes to all IQ measurements, because there's so many different varieties of ways that IQs are measured. There's so many different contexts that they can be taken in and stuff that basically, even if there is some measurement happening, there's going to be enough outlier cases that the IQ antenna measurement isn't going to have enough fidelity to pick up all these details. And as a result, there can be major distortions in the data that makes it pretty much useless. And if we're talking about IQ as a whole with all these different varieties of testing and, you know, like data from the past about IQ used whatever testing mechanisms they used at the time. And maybe you could see in a reference or citation what sort of method they used. And it's almost certainly different than what someone would use today. So as a result, we're comparing unlike streams of data in general when we're talking about IQ. The difference between doing a reading test and an intelligence test is really different. So to take a reading math comprehension pattern recognition test all together at once and then to create a generalized number from that... I don't think there's actually any use for that. That couldn't be replaced by things that actually make sense. Yeah, I think some of the research would be people in families have similar IQs or that IQs are relatively stable over lifetimes according to whatever times they've tried to measure that. Or there's things that people will point to to say that it's real or that IQs correlate to life outcomes, like how good you'll end up doing in school and generally how much money you'll end up making on average. You can correlate it with IQ. But all of these things can be explained by confounding factors. And even when they try to incorporate confounding factors, you do see effects diminishing, maybe still there, but it's really hard to control for all of them. Whereas my intuition and my experience is that anyone can understand any concept generally if they're motivated to understand it and if they have access to the information in a way that works with how they best learn things. So either that be someone to explain it to them or a documentary about it or a book about it in a way that can bridge from their current knowledge, whatever it is, to understanding this concept. There's just differences in ways people are able to understand things and how they best get to the end point of understanding things. And we've taken a subset of ways that people can understand things like reading or being able to play these metagames, take these tests, do good in school. And we've said, this is what intelligence is, this individualistic thing inside you. I can imagine a lot of situations where two people with quote unquote 95 IQs bouncing ideas back and forth might be able to figure certain things out better than people with 150 IQs in two individual rooms trying to think through the problem or even talking to each other. People understand things differently and think through things differently. And 
I agree that IQ tests are measuring something. Maybe it's just how good you do at IQ tests. Maybe it's how good you do at testing in general, this metagame of testing, or like maybe it's specific types of understanding, like reading comprehension and ability to do X particular thing in Y particular way. But that doesn't mean you can't do X particular thing in a different way and that doing it the IQ test way is better or what intelligence really is. Yeah, I think any individual IQ test can measure something, but the answer to what it measured will be different each time. And it becomes really dangerous to treat dissimilar testing contexts and dissimilar tests as all measuring the same continuum. I think it really does primarily measure your familiarity with the meta of the test, some things like cultural bias and relationship between the tester and the testing subject. All these things are so bound up in it that I actually want to take a more IQ is actually fully bullshit IQ nihilist position. Like, I don't think it really measures something. Yeah. That's the conclusion I'm coming to. I feel like if we wanted to measure intellectual capacity on an objective spectrum, I think there's a real argument about whether we should try to do that in the first place. What usefulness it actually has to try to create a scoreboard of mental capacity to compare people on. I'm not sure that that's actually very useful. I think I would say that I think that the ranking system itself fundamentally dovetails with an ideology of domination and hierarchical modes of thought that the IQ formulation itself, even if we improved all the specifics, if we're trying to create a general intelligence number, it's going to invite all modes of hierarchical domination and social strife between people to treat that number as some authentic thing. We now go to an alternate universe where Stephen Jay Gould is wrong, where it's both possible to meaningfully find a single number to intelligence, and you can meaningfully rank people on it. Oof, just uh, got turned down for another job today. I almost had it, you know, I convinced them I could do the job, but, you know, someone with a higher brain point score than me, they applied and then they said, well, obviously they're better than you at this, so... I lost it. You know what they say, there's a there's a single meaningful number to intelligence and you have to be able to rank people on it. That's just yeah. That's the way it is. Absolutely. You know, I didn't get it at first. It was like, oh, we've discovered a single meaningful number to intelligence. But someone higher than me had to walk me through it and just say, and some numbers are bigger than others. And so therefore, people are ranked now and you're well below me this is what the person said to me yeah i remember asking at first i was like okay well even if there is a single number to intelligence that mine's lower does that inherently mean that people with larger scores are better than people with lower scores more deserving of opportunities more deserving of human rights you know respect and dignity and and (laughs) i was so stubborn i thought the two weren't connected but it's just it just makes sense you know the number's bigger right when there's only so much rights to go around you have to deprive the lower numbers and us us bottom quartiles we just got to deal with it And I just didn't get that it's like someone with a score one higher than me is going to be slightly better than me at everything. And everyone who has the same number of them will be the same good as them at things. And there's just these groups of people who are all the same as each other and slightly better and worse than the people next to them. And when I looked out at the world, I didn't see that. I saw a big mix of people being good and bad at things. But... You know, one of the high brain point people sat me down and they said, no, no, you're just confused. When you think that a low brain point person is doing better than a high brain point person at something, either there's something else going on there to explain it, or you're just thinking that doing better is gooder because your head isn't gooder. I think that's what they said. Bit of a tongue twister, but... No, I mean, the thing that made me sort of recognize this truth is you look around at all these high brain point people achieving this incredible success, you know, fabulously wealthy, have all these great opportunities, and just clearly they're doing something right. You can tell from their success that their capacity is higher, therefore their conclusions that this ranked hierarchy, you know, degrading people like us is natural. So... That's why they give us these colored armbands to, uh, you know, like, for example, if there's a medical crisis and there's two people who both need help and it's like you help the people with the better colored armbands first. And just, uh, yeah, I still have these nagging thoughts that they're somehow ethically wrong, but 
It's a high brain point perspective. I mean, I wanted to have children. I didn't want to be sterilized. It was definitely involuntary sterilization, but... Yeah, me too. Eventually, I came to realize that it's for the best. Because imagine a society with only the high brain point people. They'd be to the stars already if we weren't holding them back. That's what they say to me anyway. And I I guess it's true. Like, they say it. Yeah. No, I think almost everything bad with the world is our fault. And the system works. The only thing unjust about it is that we can't help the high BPs more, honestly. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm a little bit hungry. Do you want to dig through these um, these dumpsters for some secondhand high brain point food and just? Uh, yeah, um, it's our place. That's what they always say. Oh, hey, ooh, that one's uh, still in the wrapper. Nice. Yeah, it's just a little stinky. This one. I'm used to eating food that's much more stinky than this, so that's great. You know, sometimes it's just stinky from the stuff that was near it. So if you put it away from the dumpster for a few minutes, it doesn't stink as much. Right. And I mean, the number is generalizable. So even our ability to tell how stinky or good or bad food is so much lesser than the high BPs. Like, oh, yeah. Again. Yeah. Even if with the same nose power, the way they would interpret those signals from the nose to tell what's good or bad, that like they would just be better at it for sure. Right, but we're not going to get high BPs to do this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's true. I feel kind of bummed from that sketch. Yeah. I just, it's not... It was a downer <laughs> sketch. And if you're worried about those characters and, and what became of them, let's just, we should just let people know. Eventually, they actually rose up and overthrow the high BPs in that universe. I realized the error of their ways. It just feels so sad. I don't want to leave them eating that garbage. I want to wrap up their story by saying, you know, right. eventually they push back, overthrow the high BPs. Absolutely. I mean, eventually in this universe, people realize that even if there was a single rankable number, that difference in capacity still wouldn't justify the kind of cruel disregard for human life that was socially practiced. And in fact, no matter where anybody was on that spectrum, they still had inherent personal value and should be treated with respect and had something to offer this society. Um, that's So that's where that kind of ended up. We don't have time to show that today, but it did happen, just so you know, for your canon chronology. Now back to our show. When I think about the utopian vision of IQ tests and the original idea behind it of identifying people who need help and being able to target them with help, I think when you talk to teachers... They're not going to tell you, oh, we don't have enough tests to tell which kids are good at bad and taking tests. They say, we have too many kids in the classroom. I know who needs help, but like I'm stretched so thin, I can't give them the help they need. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough people. We don't have so many of the things that we need. So many of these kids' families don't have the things they need to support these kids before they get to school. Doing a test to find out who does good at taking tests or who has the most quote unquote brain points doesn't do anything to get help to the people who need it. And most school systems, the way it works in a lot of places in America is that you get less funding the worse kids do on tests, not more. So it doesn't get help to the people who need it, it does the opposite. Another thing. Some people are better at thinking through things with someone else, where you talk it through together and go back and forth. Why is that version of thinking things through less brain good than being able to think them through by yourself on a test with a timer running as this weird metagame? Defining the ability to think as the ability to think well under pressure while engaging in information in a written form and in this solitary, it's a very individualistic, weird way to conceptualize what intelligence is. And if we're talking about a utopian version of measuring deep capacity in some sense, I don't know why we would want to do that necessarily, or if it is a meaningful idea But I think the closest we could approximate it would be like, what can people accomplish in a well-supported environment, not a weird, 
isolated testing environment. Yeah, like testers being integrated in some sort of intellectual community and not just being isolated nodes being tested by themselves. It's the wrong assumption about human intelligence to do that. Yeah, when I'm thinking about capacity and how good someone can do a particular thing, another thing that humans have that cars don't is that we can ask humans what that experience was like for them, like taking that test. What was that like for you? Why didn't you answer these questions? What could make that better for you? What things confused you? What do you need in order to do that better? If we want to know people's capacities, people's true ability to do things, we need to offer them as much support as they need to help them learn how to do it. And if we're not helping them to the extent that we can, then we're not measuring what they can do in an actual sense. We're measuring what they can do under particular kinds of restrictions of lack of support. Right. Well, and especially in cases where this sort of stuff was used to mass test children to decide which children were going to be placed in which class. And when you just pick a random kid off the street and you give them this multiple question test to generate a number that represents their intellectual capacity, think about all the different ways that data could be distorted by a child's capacity for attention and interest in being tested and stuff like that. There's historic examples of this sort of testing being used in ways that basically ruins children's lives because they have trouble reading. And then they're permanently classified as someone who, back in the early 1900s, they used terms like imbecile and moron as classifications based on IQ levels. And then as a result, they would deprive those children of access to education. For example, there's a Radio Lab series, we'll link in the show notes, about the history of IQ. And one of the episodes that they do, they talk about this court case in California where the NAACP sued the state of California about the uses of IQ tests in schools. So they were using this test to separate children into remedial classes. But in result, they have an interview with one of the kids now grown up who experienced this. It's like he had trouble reading. And as a result of not being able to read the test well, he did really poorly on it. He was moved into special ed classes, and the special ed classes didn't give him extra support in helping him to better learn things. Instead, just expected almost nothing of him and just thought that he couldn't even learn things. And they went on field trips and stuff instead of actually learning the subject matter that he was falling behind on. It's because he performed poorly on one test one time that he wasn't given an opportunity to prepare for. And so as a result, the case ended up being concluded with California banning school districts giving IQ tests to black children because the kid in question was black. And during the court proceedings, they were able to kind of prove that the people giving the tests were white racists. And rather than banning the taking of IQ tests for all kids, which is what they probably should have done, they ended up just banning it for that specific group that was targeted by that racism. It's not the case that any particular ethnicity or cultural group consistently does worse on all IQ tests in all circumstances or something like that. That's a white supremacist myth. You'll run into racists who make this sort of argument, and they make this argument based on data that actually comes from eugenicists, white supremacists, running bias tests, who are seeking to advance a political agenda of white supremacy. Supremacy. That sort of stuff is just brutal. And it's tied up in even when we're taking tests for fun now, it's part of that same trajectory and history in a way. We now go to a bowling alley where two friends are having a conversation about the eugenicist origin of IQ. Dang it, gutter ball. Oh no, I'm telling you, man, these shoes are too tight. Always got to remember to ask for a size up at the bowling alley. The shoes. Right. Yeah. Blame the shoes. They're not good. It happens to all of us. I'm just yanking your chain. Yeah. I didn't think IQ was that bad or like I didn't expect it to be that bad. But when I started reading about it, the origins of it and how it was used and popularized over the last hundred years, dozens and dozens of examples of being misused through institutions of power to oppress and damage regular people. Yeah, I always thought of it as a pretty good thing with a few bad things tacked on top, but the more I look into it, the more I think, just not a good method of analysis of what people are capable of. 
Alfred Binet, who invented the first intelligence test of this type, he wasn't a eugenicist himself, but the term IQ was popularized by a eugenicist who worked on the Yerkes Bridge intelligence test and deploying it on all the army officers in the United States or all the recruits to determine their capacity and where they would fit in the organization. In 1918, they did that. But it's really popular, especially with the rich and powerful, because it is so compatible with their ideas of natural hierarchy, with some people being above and below others and stuff like that. Eugenics was a really, really popular idea among the rich and powerful before it was popular among normal people. And so eugenics was taught in universities in the early 1900s. And some prominent eugenicists took the idea from Alfred Binet and he set it up to determine kids' intellectual age to give them more support. And they took that idea to create IQ, which is you divide someone's tested age by 100 and then times it by their actual age or vice versa, something like that. And it gives you the scale around 100 where 100 is average. But the people who did this were part of a movement from the start. They're eugenicists and just explicitly racist. They didn't just believe that there was differences between races or differences between people of different IQ scores. They believe that there should be selective breeding programs through sterilization to prevent that and selective immigration programs based on these test scores. So IQ tests were invented by eugenicists for the purposes of making these racist arguments. Imagine if my bowling score from this one round was used to generalize out to all of my sports skills it was like my sports quotient and then yeah a single transferable rankable number for each person their single sports number yeah and then people who are obsessed with human breeding take on that idea and want to create a super race of only really good at sports people and you know along with a whole bunch of weird ideas about too much masturbation and like populations degenerating they want to call me feeble sports and put me in institutions or sterilize me that's about the level of logic from my understanding of what these eugenicists did with IQ no that's totally true in the decade following the invention of IQ sterilization laws were put on the books in a number of states in the U.S. where people could be sterilized for being what they called feeble-minded. These laws were on the books for the majority of the last hundred years in the U.S. in a variety of places. And also IQ tests were used to turn away refugees at Ellis Island. It was one of the major arguments that was used to push for immigration restrictions in the 1920s for the first time. And this whole time, too, there is this racial element to it because there was this sort of first proto-bell curve kind of thing in the early 1920s where there was this book arguing that based on these test scores from the military is that there was different intelligence between races. Right, yeah, and that's the historical milieu that's going on for the decades leading up to when, in the late 1930s, the son of a textile baron, Wycliffe Draper, decides to create the Pioneer Fund, which is explicitly racialized in the way that it talks about eugenics and wanting to promote the genetic stock of those deemed to be descended predominantly from white people. And he pours millions of dollars into this. What happened in the eugenics movement was that there were these different schools of thought within eugenics, and one strand of it was more racially focused. And this is before Hitler rises to power, but is more compatible directly with Hitler's ideas white supremacist, anti-Semitic, hard racist eugenics existed in the eugenics movement the whole time. But these were organizations that were funded by major philanthropic organizations like the Carnegie Foundation. And someone named Harry Laughlin worked for the Carnegie Fund's eugenics group. He was one of the major testimonies to immigration committees in arguing for restrictive immigration. And he was also hired as the first administrator of the Pioneer Fund, because by the time that happened in the 1930s, the wave of eugenics had crested an American society and was associated with Hitler and the Nazis. Harry Laughlin praised the Nazis in his eugenics newsletter. He was one of the most prominent eugenicists in America during these decades, and he left the eugenics records office, which was the Carnegie-funded thing, and joined the Pioneer Fund near the end of his life. Basically because the culture of mainstream science, which had been 30 years before, completely in line with his racism to the point where he could say the same things in both contexts, it became an unfavorable position because of Nazism. And he sided with Wycliffe Draper 
this rich inheritor of a fortune who was basically pushing a hardcore white supremacist eugenicist narrative at a time when support for it was fading they were like radicalized yeah and the foundation they create ends up going on to spend decades and decades funding biased research finding racists they can find like arthur jensen roger pearson and others just finding racist academics giving them in the case of jensen over a million dollars over the course of his academic career to fund research specifically to back up this particular narrative of white superiority creating this body of research that is being responded to at the time there's many great debunks you can go into they go over it all and a lot of it is extremely shoddy and Wycliffe Draper it's really clear from his life's work that he was motivated by this white supremacist animus to put the money in the places that he did he didn't just fund research on human intelligence which he gave to white supremacists he put money into fighting integration fighting civil rights he fought for private schools when segregation was happening he was a very active and very rich white supremacist who was very influential in american life and it seems like though like no matter how many times people go over this bad data and explain why it is wrong and point out the people at who are funding it and why it exists. All it takes is a little bit of time for people to forget. And then, you know, you get in 1994, Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein coming along and writing a book, referencing it all, all over again, and making those very similar arguments about limiting immigration. Uh, they argue in favor of putting an IQ test for people to not just enter the country, but to get jobs, like maybe electricians should have to have a certain IQ or any job that's sufficiently complicated. We shouldn't just see who can do the job and let that be the metric. We should put this other hyper grid world test in between them. And then that's what we should use to decide. You were talking about the amount of rejections at Ellis Island going up and like people unjustly being excluded based on IQ. And I had just read about advocacy for IQ tests for job placements and how it's illegal at this point, but that Murray and Hernstein say it shouldn't be illegal. And that just really is the same shit warmed over decades later. And then two decades after that, Charles Murray shows up on Sam Harris's podcast to warm it over again. He also paid for every time there was a bell curve type book that came out. There's one called Race and Reason, one called The Testing of Negro Intelligence. There's like a dozen books like this over the last century, which are all also clustered around these groups of American white supremacists, often explicitly. Draper paid money to print thousands and thousands of copies of these books and have them mailed to politicians, statesmen, business leaders, and so on. So they were actively, aggressively looking to influence the sort of upper crust of American political society. So he was a big financier of all this kind of stuff for a long time. There's a book about him called The Funding of Scientific Racism, Wycliffe Draper and the Pioneer Fund. But yeah, he was like a super rich white supremacist activist. And the books that he funded being published and the research that he funded racists to do echoes throughout history are cited in the bell curve. They're cited by Sam Harris and they're cited by any mainstream liberal who embraces these ideas. He funded the day that these racist movements are at least ostensibly predicated on. It's interesting to me that the people who argue that IQ is useful often want to talk about like Binet wanted, being able to offer help to people who need it. But the people who wield IQ as a weapon politically nearly exclusively use it as a tool to say that people are incapable of being helped, and so there's no point, and so we shouldn't have welfare, we shouldn't have equal opportunity for everyone, we should just discard people who seem like they can't be helped and hopefully they'll breed less or maybe we can actually forcibly sterilize them. But even in school systems saying that IQ tests are there to, or standardized tests, which have similar results to IQ tests usually, they say it's to identify the kids who need help, but in practice it ends up being a way to take help away from the kids who need help because schools that do lower on standardized testing end up getting less funding. Even in the best versions of what we think IQ testing should be used for, the structural echoes of eugenicist ideas of 
taking resources away from those deemed to be at the bottom of the IQ or smartness or worthiness scale that we've developed. It worms its way into everywhere that we use these kinds of measurement tools. Definitely. And I think IQ is just one particular permutation. The underlying ideas here extend further in history, this hierarchical naturalism. There's all these premises and weird assumptions from society that end up making IQ this thing that when you weigh the whole history of the trajectory of IQ, it's hard to not notice that there's all of these horrific things that have been done through the lens of assuming that intelligence is directly heritable, is non-changeable, has a strong genetic component. All these things that underlie the IQ ideology, they've left so much brutal devastation in their wake of human beings who have missed out on the opportunity to live the fullest lives they could. And everyone misses out as a result of that for living in a less vibrant and rich society. But it's undeniable that the concept of IQ arose in a eugenicist concept and has been primarily used throughout history as a way to reinforce all of these brutal hierarchical structures. What you were talking about before, the costs of giving people extra education and stuff, one of the details I found in my research that was kind of horrifying and underlines some of these ideological undercurrents is that a lot of these ideas of economic efficiency and not wasting money supporting people who can't use it anyways and stuff like that, basically what Charles Murray is arguing in The Bell Curve and his political argument against welfare based on pseudoscientific racist IQ analysis. But that same idea is promoted by eugenicists in the US across the last century, but it was also promoted by the Nazis. The Nazis had propaganda posters about how the disabled wasted all this resources. They even changed school curriculums with elementary and high school students to have math problems about the high costs of mental institutions, saying like, oh, if we spend this much money keeping all these insane people and degenerates alive, it'll cost us this much. But if we exterminate them, it will save us this much money. That was the shape of the questions that they were giving students in schools as part of their state ideology. So there's a deep continuity between what Charles Murray is doing and what the Nazis were doing there and what the eugenicists were doing when they started popularizing the idea of IQ. And having all this context for this has just really turned me against IQ in a way that's way more fundamental than I expected when I set out on this research. Wow, and another strike too. Only you could deliver a speech like that and get a strike in bowling at the same time. That's impressive. Oh, thank you. Sometimes I find if I get in like a weird little groove, then I stop thinking about what my hands are doing, you know? It's beautiful to watch you. It's like a dance, the way you grab that ball and run it right down the middle of the lane. And it's amazing. Hit the pins down. Cool. Yeah. Nothing like a deep conversation about difficult topics at the bowling alley, though. Yeah, it's so fun to research something at the same time as your friend and then both talk about what you learned. Yeah. Adding bowling to the mix. Hey, that doesn't hurt either. I'm a bowling maniac. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And I like to think that we help all the people near us as well who can hear us talking about this and keep looking at us and like they're like, oh, so interesting. Yeah, they keep looking at us. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like they're actually quite interested to learn about this history. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of interest, a lot of interest on those faces. Just from the amount of people looking at us, yeah. Yeah. The amount of looks, eye contact and stuff. It's not something you would do unless you were like at attention. Uh, oh, hey. Oh yeah, just two left, they're in the same spot. That's an easy spare. And that was two friends talking about eugenics and IQ at a bowling alley. Now back to the show. We now go to an alternate universe where Stephen Jay Gould is wrong, and there's a meaningful single number to intelligence, you can rank people on it, and it's highly heritable. Boy, boy, you're home from school. Hey, Papa, My yeah. My equally as intelligent to me, boy. I was learning something really cool at school today. I was learning about the Seventh Ottoman Venetian War. Ah, of course. It was fought between the, the Republic, Republic of Venice, Venice and the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, Empire between 1714 and 1718. It was, it was the last conflict between the two powers and ended with the Ottoman victory and the loss of Venice's major possession in the Greek Peninsula, peninsula the Peloponnese. <laughs> oh, wow, Papa, you <laughs> said it at the same time as me. I guess we really are equally intelligent. Yeah. 
you know, a slightly more or slightly less intelligent person, even if they knew the same information, might have phrased it slightly differently. But I thought you kids were learning about statistical mechanics. Well, I already and, know about uh, st- the way that it, it develops, develops the phenomenological results of thermodynamics from a probabilistic examination of the underlying microscopic systems. systems. Historically, one of the first topics in physics where statistical methods were applied was the field of classical mechanics, which is concerned with the motion of particles or objects when subjected to a force. Uh, oh, oh, Papa. Boy. Oh, boy. Uh, just two of a kind we are. Two peas in a pod in terms of intelligence levels. Well, you're the one to thank for that, Dad, because your heritable brain power number, I just got it exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. One to the next. One to the next. What are you thinking for dinner? Hmm. Let me think about this logically. So if we had salad and then pasta and pasta and then salad, that means that we're due for, rationally speaking, an Asian, Asian fusion, fusion stir fry. fry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you knew exactly boy. what I was going to say, Papa. Uh, why do I even bother quizzing you anymore on stuff like this? You always get it right. You always get the same answer I would. You know, I feel exactly the same amount of proud of you right now that I think my Papa felt of me when I was a boy. And we had the same intelligence, me and him. Right. Well, if you had different levels of intelligence, you might have different levels of pride. That just makes perfect sense. That almost makes as much sense as the fact that some quantum theories of gravity posit a spin-2 quantum field that is quantized, giving rise to gravitrons. In string theory, one generally starts with quantized excitations on top of a classically fixed background. Particles like photons, as well as changes in the space-time geometry, i.e. gravitrons, are both described as excitations on the string world sheet. The background dependence of string theory can have important physical consequences, such as determining the number of quark generations. <laughs> like father like son like father like son that meaningful single number that you can rank people on gets passed down very linearly like that same way that someone might inherit blue eyes they can inherit a single rankable number of intelligence and i think we're living proof of that papa yeah and the fact that all other papas and boys are just like us the the exact same i mean not that they all have the same number as us but that they're all the same as each other I knew exactly what you meant, Papa, because we're equally intelligent. Ah, yeah, I know. And that was a Papa and a boy with exactly equal intelligence points numbers, which are directly heritable and people can be ranked linearly on because in this alternate universe, which isn't our universe, Stephen Jay Gould was wrong. So to quote a great song, IQ, huh? What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Right. And just to be clear in the song, it says war, not IQ. The quoted part is it still applies as well. But right, yeah. if you go Google the song, yeah. Right. I might've got that detail wrong, but I think the spirit <laughs> is very, right. I might've misremembered part of the song, but I IQ, still think the... <laughs> what is it good for? Nothing. I would listen to that. After the things I've learned this week, I would listen to that song. Yeah, IQ, not really good for anything. I mean, we could keep it around as a weird historical anachronism. People can take IQ tests as a funny way to see how things were in the past, and that's a game people play. And we probably have to change the name because IQ implies that it's measuring an intelligence quotient. But if it was kind of like a reading comprehension, math, variety game test, like the variety test, you know, what's your VT score on the variety, you know, like, it's like Wordle. Have you played Wordle? Everyone's been talking about Wordle on Twitter. Yeah, I've played, I played Wordle. (laughs) You played? We break off IQ testing into just a single online game where people can brag about their score, where they're hit with a variety of different questions week after week that change all the time, that have an updated, continually changing, and less predictable meta with your average score out of 50 over time could be your number. So yeah, if someone wants to set up variety testing and socially as a society, we want to give it about as much credence as we give like your Wordle streaks, I think that's a valid use for IQ tests as we know them now. But in terms of identifying kids to give them help, as we've talked about, I think the teachers know who need help and they actually just need resources. 
Right. And I mean, Benet, from what I can tell, seems like a nice enough guy who meant the best. But there was still these weird implications in the way that the test is set up in the first place. He was basically trying to find students who needed extra help that you couldn't otherwise tell needed extra help. His assumption was that there were people who are obviously intellectually disabled. And then there's like a secret group of intellectually disabled people hiding amongst the people who seem normal to him. So like that's the whole pretense of the development of the test in the first place is try to find these hidden imbeciles, these secret morons among us. And morons and imbeciles, those terms have a hugely loaded and really despicable history where a variety of these terms, idiot, moron, imbecile, feeble-minded, they were used as like legal classifications to deprive people of their rights as individuals. People were often miscategorized as them very easily for a variety of reasons. They were often sterilized as a result of the results on IQ tests. Using these labels, the Nazis killed tens of thousands of disabled people, calling them idiots in their official documents. And I wanted to talk briefly about heritability because it's one of Gould's four main arguments. And I feel like we've talked a lot about just tearing apart IQ tests and like really getting under the logic there that it almost feels to me like an afterthought that the amount that parents and kids would correlate on their test results probably isn't a result of genes because the whole concept of IQ doesn't make sense. Because the heritability argument, it starts off weak from the beginning, like even Hernstein and Murray in the bell curve say that it's between 40 to 80% heritable as a range. And then, of course, they go on to just kind of assume that it's closer to 80. Joseph Graves in our recent episode mentioned genome-wide association studies showing in certain populations about a 15% amount of the variation in IQ could be related to genetics. And you can't take numbers of heritability from within particular studies and then use them to compare across groups. It's like one of the main ways the heritability stuff gets used or the reason they care about it is because you can then make these group differences and genetics arguments and different ethnicities have different IQ levels and whatnot. And there's so many problems with that. Racial categories have no genetic basis in the first place. IQ itself doesn't make any sense as a singular concept. So it's really, it's just like, you know, reading tea leaves at that point. But even within the tea leaf reading, they make a bunch of like fundamental errors. Like people hear 40% heritability and they think that's like a locked in genetic thing. It's like, it's always 40% and 60% from the environment. But it's like, no, it really depends on how much influence the environment is having. The environment can be having a ton of influence. And then therefore, in that situation, the genetic component of heritability goes down, or you could be in a situation where the environment is very similar across the board, and then you would see variation that's only due to heritability. If a particular plant is grown in two different dishes in good soil and bad soil, the plants in the good soil grow taller on average than the plants in the bad soil. But when you look at either dish as an isolated experiment, Since the conditions are equalized in a laboratory setting, any variation in height in the dish, which will likely be pretty small, will be due 100% due to genetics. And when you compare between the two dishes, which might have a very big height difference between them, the difference between the two groups is 100% due to the difference in conditions, the different soil. Yeah, so again, there's never any ironclad number of it's this percent genetics, this percent environment. It always depends on the context from which you're measuring it and what you're comparing it to and how much influence the environment is having in that particular case. But again, I feel like it's even missing the point talking about it because we're talking about the heritability of this abstract number based on mixing together tests and assuming that there's this one way to sum up people's capacity with a single number. It's like, it just seems like missing the mark to even go down that road too much. And when people do, they make all these basic mistakes of comparing unlike with unlike environments and transposing heritability numbers from within groups into between groups, which you just can't do fundamentally. And these tests are so different from each other. You can't compare 
from an IQ test to another test cleanly, because at different times in history, they were using all sorts of different methodologies, and there's no consistency between that data. You can't compare data from one trial to another. And then because of cultural biases and stuff like that, you can't even compare data within the single test to itself. And it's impossible to make a single number that refers to the entirety of intelligence. Intelligence is extremely complicated, varied within it, hard to pin down and define. We don't rank computers with a computer quotient. Oh, my CQ is 140. That means it's really high powered. You talk about the actual RAM, hard drive, motherboard, graphics card and stuff. It's because when we take a subject seriously, we talk about the details that actually comprise it. So to use IQ as a serious measurement is to not take intelligence seriously. It's like having a happiness quotient where you rank people on a single line about how happy they are across their lifetimes. Anything like that is going to have such a limited use, if any use at all. IQ tests literally rob us of understanding of understanding, like how understanding works and what it is. Right. That understanding is taken from us by simplifying to a single number. Yeah. If you're using standardized measurements to try and identify people who need something, you're going to imagine that there's a standardized application rather than looking at each individual person who needs help and asking them what help they need. Why don't they understand it? Is it because they're having trouble reading? Is it because they're emotional from something that's happening at home? Is it because they're just not interested in the subject and want to learn about something else right now. There's a million types of help that people need and everybody's different. And looking at everyone through a single lens of smart to dumb robs us of all the information and nuance and understanding that we need to understand what kinds of help each individual person actually needs. That makes me think the meta ideology of without actually talking to the student, having them take a test and then like a machine again, without talking to them based on that test, sorting them into these different bins. There's something so profoundly inhuman about it and this bizarre, almost mechanistic ideology underlying it. There's this premise of IQ testing in the first place that part of having a student have a relationship with a test, a paper set of trials put in front of them is going to be the best way to get information about them is a weird assumption. And then the assumption that you can take that test and then just use the information that you get from judging their response to it to then sort them into categories is itself a weird assumption. And then that those categories would refer to inherent capacity is an even bigger, bizarre assumption. Really, really weird. You're starting to get weird guy brain there. Where <laughs> you're starting to get creepy mindset. When you start, <laughs> those first two premises are bizarre and wrong, but they don't strike me as Machiavellian or somehow deeply twisted on the nature of humanity. But that third one really pushes it to another level. It just makes so much more sense that you'd want to talk to children to understand them or even talk to adults to understand them. And that you could probably get a better sense of where people are focused on and what their most highly developed capacities are and what their less developed capacities are and stuff like that. And I can't think of many cases where you'd actually get better information from a test. I think probably no cases. In terms of the strength of its information, if it's broken on that many levels, how can it at all be something to take seriously? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's pattern grid world shit. <laughs> fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of reality to think everything in these linear scales and sharp right angles and you can list everything and rank everything and punch numbers into a computer and figure out how to pick the best superior people scientifically unsound it's always been scientifically unsound and it's always been pushed by adherence of political ideological positions that are using it to bolster their agendas. So we're coming out against IQ. IQ is bullshit. It's actually way more bullshit than I expected. Holy shit. There's so many ways that IQ is bullshit. It is unbelievable. And again, we have just scratched the surface on the ways that this is bullshit. And we barely scratched the surface on all of the horrific 
racism, eugenic, ableism shit in the history of IQ too. We've talked a bit about that, but in order to really talk about that, it would take an entire other episode, maybe two more episodes, maybe eight more episodes. Yeah. I mean, if you wanted to, you could do an 800 episode podcast 